Praise the Lord to everyone. We're bringing you greetings from Greater Works Apostolic Blue Life Center in the wonderful city of champions. That's Inglewood, California. We're blessing God on today for all of our viewing audience from far and near. We thank you all for your participation in this ministry, and we are very pleased to serve you with gladness. Amen. At this time, we're going to go ahead and get started with a word of prayer. Father God, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we thank you for this day. We appreciate you, Lord, for life, health, and strength. Lord, we're blessing your name on today because the name that was given to us is the name of Jesus. And that name is the name that's above every name. That every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess that you are Lord and Savior of our lives. So we thank you and we appreciate you, Lord. We thank you for this is the day that you've made. We're going to rejoice and be glad in it. We thank you, Lord, for our health, our strength, being in the land of the living. We thank you, Lord, right now for breath in our bodies, the functions of our minds, Lord. We thank you, Lord, right now for serving you in these last and evil days, Lord. Seeking your face while it may be found in 2021, Lord. We're asking you all today, Lord, to bless each and every one of your people under the sound of my voice. Lord, you know all things, Lord. And we thank you, Lord, for knowing that all things work together for good to them that love the Lord. And we thank you, Lord, right now for knowing, Lord, despite pandemic, despite death, despite anything that's negative that we have gone through thus far, we know that you are still in control. We ask you, Lord, a special prayer request, Lord, for uh, the battle and the Starkey family right now in the name of Jesus. So we thank you for your comfort, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for mending the broken heart in the name of Jesus, Lord. Blessing them in their bereavement from our very own friend and sister in the Lord, Sister Stark, you Lord. We thank you, Lord, right now for blessing that family as we speak in the name of Jesus. Those who have recently lost loved ones, Lord, mend their broken hearts, Lord. We thank you for knowing, Lord, that you are in control even in death, Lord. We thank you for knowing, Lord, that their names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. By faith. We thank you, Lord, for blessing the Swansea family, Lord, blessing the Ford family, blessing all of the families, Lord, that we know that have dealt with death recently, Lord, in the name of Jesus, Lord. We thank you, Lord, right now for increasing our faith in 2021, Lord. Bless our going out. Bless our coming in, Lord, in the name of Jesus, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for victory, Lord. We thank you, Lord, right now for overcoming anything, Lord, that's not of you. In the name of Jesus, Lord, we thank you, Lord, for your healing virtue. Those who are sick and afflicted in the convalescent homes, those who are sick and afflicted, Lord, at their uh, homes, Lord, we ask you, Lord, to restore their health, Lord, in the name of Jesus, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for salvation being preached and teached in 2021. We thank you, Lord, for the baptism in the name of Jesus. So we thank you, Lord, for your Holy Ghost yes. power, according to the Apostles' Doctrine. We ask you, Lord, to bless all the ministries under the sound of my voice. Bless the pastors, Lord. Bless right now, Lord, the bishops, Lord. Bless all of the saints and friends, Lord, in the name of Jesus, Lord. Bless our communities, Lord. Heal our land. Heal our government, Lord. Heal yes. our workplace, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for deliverance, Lord, right now in the name of Jesus. We thank you, Lord, for blessing, Lord, your power, your Holy Ghost power, that dunamis power, Lord, right now to be imputed into our communities, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for the lost souls being found. We thank you, Lord, for those who are dealing with a sinful nature to be delivered and, and, and brought to you in the name of Jesus, Lord. We thank you for increase in 2021. Job opportunities 
in 2021. Bills being paid, financial improvement, Lord, we thank you. Housing, we thank you, Lord. Families coming together, we thank you, Lord. Our spiritual natures being enhanced, yes, Lord. we thank you, we praise you, we glorify, we magnify your name, for you alone are worthy of all honor, all glory that belongs to you. In the mighty master's name of Jesus, in Jesus' name we all pray, in Jesus' name we pray, amen. At this time, we're going to go uh, before the Lord uh, with a brief scripture, amen, out of the book or divisions of Psalms. And we're coming, amen, from Psalms chapter 54. We're going to start from verses 1 through 7 in Jesus' name. Amen. And it reads, Save me, O God, by thy name, and judge me by thy strength. Hear my prayer, O God. Give ear to the words of my mouth. For strangers are risen up against me, and oppressors seek after my soul. They have not set God before them. Selah. Behold, God is my helper. The Lord is with them that uphold my soul. He shall reward evil unto my enemies. Cut them off in thy truth. I will freely sacrifice unto thee. I will praise thy name. O Lord, for it is good. The last verse reads, For he has delivered me out of all trouble, and my eye have seen his desire upon my enemies. May the Lord have a blessing to the reading, the hearing, and the doing of his word in Jesus' name. Amen. And at this time, we're going to come before you with praise and worship. Amen. And this will be uh, conducted by none other than the Greater Works Apostolic New Life Center Praise and Worship Team. Amen. Led by none other than Minister Melissa and Sister Nakisha fights. Let's receive them by shouting hallelujah. And let's bless the Lord with us. And bless the Lord with us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Somebody shout hallelujah. Hallelujah. Somebody shout hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Come on, let's just take a few moments. Let's just lift up our hands and give God some thanks. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Have an attitude of gratitude right now. Hallelujah. Lord, we thank you. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Lord, we praise you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That's why my heart. Come on, somebody say, that's why my heart is filled Hallelujah. with praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. I love you. I love you I love you Lord today because you care for me and such a special
Oh, somebody just put, post in the comments, my heart is filled with praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm coming with an attitude of gratitude on this morning, and my heart is filled with praise. At this time, we want to go into our Christian education. Somebody ought to just be glad for Christian education, and let's receive none other than our very own Lady Valerie Fike. Somebody give her a shout of hallelujah, hallelujah. as she comes in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord, everyone. We want to give honor to God on this afternoon, thanking him for just one more opportunity to be in the land of the living, thanking him for life, for health, for strength, for food, clothing, and shelter. We give honor unto a great, great God. Hallelujah. We thank him, hallelujah, for just being with us on today. We appreciate you inviting us into your living rooms and into your heart. And we give honor unto God for that on today, bringing you greetings from the Greater Works Apostolic New Life Center Christian Education Department. We appreciate all of you on this morning. I know most of you go in the morning, the early morning to Sunday school, but we can do Christian education any time, time of day. So we appreciate you tuning in with us on today. We have a very, uh, very, very wonderful lesson on this morning. It's called God is Always Faithful. God is always, when they say always, and when we think about always, we think about when it never, there's not, ne never a uh, uh, intermission that is always there. It's absolute. It's not sometimes, it's not every now and then, but it is faithful always, meaning that you don't have to worry about God coming through because God is dependable. And when you're dependable, we know that you will always be there when you're dependable. So we know that we serve a dependable God and God is faithful in that. God is the one that uh, he comes through when you don't think he's going to come through. He does things when you don't think he's going to do them because that's the kind of God that we serve. And we're looking at this this morning because we're talking about um, the book of Malachi and the things that happen. These um, Israelites and the children of Israel are still coming back and being reformed from all of the things that they went through during their captivity. Now they're coming back and trying to restore things and getting things back to normal. And in doing that, every now and then, a major or a minor prophet has to come in to situate them, to establish their thoughts, to get them back on the right track so that they can please God in the way that he wants them to please him. Hallelujah. Our focus thought this morning is con continual reminders of God's faithfulness keep spiritual discouragement at bay. You see, when you know that God is faithful and you can see the things that he does, you know that uh, when it's time for you to be discouraged or to have fear, you can relax because you know that God is a faithful God. And that's why we have to be reminded on the things that he does to help us so that we can be established in his way. The focus verse comes from Malachi chapter 3, verse 6. And it says, and I love this book of Malachi because he says a lot of things. He gets a lot of things straight. He, uh, There's no uh, stone that's not turned over when Malachi begins to speak. And he even asks questions and answers them at the same time. So we're going to get into Malachi on today to see exactly what he's talking about and how he is instrumental in helping the children of Israel to be to recognize and realize that God is always faithful. You don't have to worry about a thing. You don't have to worry about lack because if you trust in God the way you should, God is going to come through for you if you follow the things that he has told you to do. 
Malachi 3 and 6 says this, For I am the Lord, I change not. Therefore, ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. He's reminding them, do you not know that it's because of me that you're not consumed? Do you know that it is because of me that you're out of, cap of captivity because I brought you out? I am the Lord. I'm the one that made the promise and I'm going to keep what I said. I'm going to keep my promise. But in the meantime, when you're doing things that you shouldn't do, sometimes there's consequences. But after I have settled myself down, I'm going to bring you back to where I said I was going to bring you in the very beginning, from the very beginning. Hallelujah. We're going to look at why God is always Faithful. We're going to do it before we come back to our lesson text. And we're going to talk about the things of Malachi. We're going to talk about after the rebuilding and talk a little bit about who Malachi is as well. The days of Malachi says the prophet Malachi is the last known prophet of the post-exile period. The paired historical books of Ezra and Nehemiah are the primary biblical sources of information about the return period. In other words, this was a time when they were coming out of captivity, coming back to Jerusalem, and they had to rebuild it. However, since the first six chapters of Ezra relate the story of the rebuilding of the temple under the leadership of the governor Zerubbabel and the high priest Joshua, it can be easily forgotten that by the time of Ezra, this was already decades old history. We know from scripture that Ezra served under the Persian rule of Arsaces, leading a group of returnees to the city of, from the Persian ruler, I'm sorry, leading a group of returnees to the city of Jerusalem. That was almost 60 years after the temple had been rebuilt and over 80 years after Cyrus had allowed the Jews to return to the promised land. We know from Ezra's account that the period of temple built rebuilding had been a period of significant revival. Led by the ministries of the prophet Haggai and Zechariah, culminating with all the people and all the men of Israel observing the Passover celebration for the first time since the days of King Josiah. So they were doing a lot of things in that day to rebuild, restore, replenish the things that were destroyed during their time of captivity. However, it is clear from the rest of the account of Ezra and Nehemiah that the spiritual fervor did not last but faded rather quickly, quenched it seems by disappointing outcomes. Our spiritual melees. Joyce Baldwin aptly describes the scene that confronted the prophet Malachi as an uneventful waiting period. She notes the prophet Ezekiel had prophesied that when the temple was rebuilt, God would fill it with his glory. However, there is no record of such a glorious manifestation accompanying the temple rededication. The round of religious duties continued to be carried on, carried on she concludes, but without enthusiasm. So in other words, God had brought them out and he began restoring the things that they needed restored. But in building his house, there was no enthusiasm. In other words, they were just doing uh, things as normal. They weren't uh, giving God glory or making him feel that they were grateful for the things that he did. They, they, weren't, uh, they didn't have the heart of gratitude that they should have had and been eager to rebuild the house. Hallelujah. This sense of disappointment slowly poisoned the people's passion for serving God. 
And that's what will happen when there's no enthusiasm. Eventually, you'll go the other way. You'll turn your head from God and begin to praise another God for your demise and for your the things that you're going through instead of giving God the glory and the honor. The signs were everywhere. They slowly began to buckle under the pressure of conformity, signaled by their intermarriage with foreign women. Nehemiah 13, 23 and 25 through 25, they were lax in their observance of sacrificial protocol, offering God the blind, lame, and sick animals of the flock, animals that would be considered an insult if offered to the human governor. Perhaps most, most of all, the people were questioning God's love for them and accusing God of actually favoring the wicked. The situation described in Malachi is all the more sobering for its boring appearance. Here we do not find some radical act of rebellion against God, as in, say, the story of the golden calf in Exodus, but there was especially given something to the Ten Commandments, the sinfulness of the people's cry to Aaron. Make us a God. It's particularly blatant. In one statement, they had violated the three commandments. In Malachi's day, no high places to false gods were constructed, nor was Jehovah's temple desecrated. Instead, the passion that had inflamed the hearts of the people in the days before, the days of Zerubbabel and Joshua, slowly faded to a flicker. So in other words, even though they weren't sinning by using or building up uh, the temple or doing things against the temple and building up um, uh, the things that they did in, uh, for idol gods in the days of Moses and Aaron, they, were, they had a spirit of uh, non-enthusiasm. They had a spirit of doubt. They didn't feel like, and it was almost a lazy spirit where they didn't want to work hard in God's house or for God. They say in a way, it's too frightening or familiar for many of us today, the people of Israel backslid while sitting on a church pew as it was. And people may think that that's very hard to do, but if we find today those people that are more, that are not busy as they were in that day, people that were, people that are uh, lackadaisical, that just uh, stay around doing nothing, not doing the things that they should do for God. When we find that out, we find that a person can sit right in their seat and backslide. We find that a person can sit in God's house every week, but think about other things that are not godly because they don't have their mind stay on the Lord. Hallelujah. And this is how a person can backslide. It may not happen overnight, but when it happens, it happens because a person is not eager to serve the Lord, but they're reluctant and they don't have the spirit of enthusiasm. Hallelujah. The real danger of discouragement is that it is transient emotion, especially at first. Feelings of discouragement are easy to shake off. However, such feelings cannot be ignored forever. You can't ignore discouragement. It's like ignoring a flat tire. Hallelujah. And that's something that we can think about. When you feel discouraged, you might shake it off at first, but you can't continue to be discouraged and be in the will of God because it will eventually take you down. You have to address it when you feel discouraged that you can get the spirit of discouragement off of you. Hallelujah. All of you want to drive all you want to. You never will you will never get the air back in the tire if you continue to drive 
on a flat tire, and then other things will begin to happen to the car. It will, be, it will cause damage to the entire vehicle just from one flat tire. When we talk about what's going on in the house of God, even though they're back in the house of God, even though things should be uh, scurrying in their hearts to do the things of God, we talk about people being discouraged and people not being enthused because of other things going on in their mind. When that happens, there are times that the prophets have to come forth and release the people and to warn the people that they might be released. Let me change that. Warn the people that they might be released. Let's see what happened in Malachi's day. Malachi's chosen method of encouragement, however, would probably not win many admirers, admirers in our secular uh, therapy-saturated society. Our culture has encountered us with the idea that the only way to overcome negative feelings is with a barrage of counterbalancing positivity. As it all too evident, such ways of thinking can easily slip into a pattern of avoidance. In other words, you're not really getting down to the problem, but you're encouraging with positivity, but you're not taking the problem in, into consideration, and that way, the person still is not helped. Where we do not truly confront the sources of our darker emotions, that's what has to be confronted the sources of our darker emotions, because we all have emotions. Malachi does not fall into any trap. Instead, he directly confronts the root causes of the people's problem. The root, when you go to the root of the problem, you can dig it out, and the problem is released and taken out of the person, removed from the person and the person goes free. Hallelujah. To do so, Malachi used a form of dialogue known as a disputation. The pattern is seen clearly in the open oracle, and I'm going to read it for you. This is from Malachi. The burden of the word of the Lord is to Israel by Malachi. I have loved you, saith the Lord. Yet ye say, Wherein has thou loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother, saith the Lord? Yet I loved Jacob and hated Esau, and laid his mountains and his heritage waste for the dragons of the wilderness. Whereas Edom said, We are impoverished, but we will return and build the desolate places. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, They shall build, but I will throw down, and they shall call them the border of wickedness, and the people against whom the Lord hath indignation forever. And your eyes shall see, and ye shall say, The Lord will be magnified from the border of Israel. In other words, it seems like he's paying more attention to those that are without him than those that say that they love him. Hallelujah. The basic pattern of the disputation is claim about the divine nature. I have loved you. People question the divine claim. How have you loved us? In other words, God, we're doing what we want to do and you're punishing us. If you loved us, you would not punish us this way. Evidence for the divine claim. Esau I have hated and laid waste his mountains and his heritage. Esau had a chance to do what Jacob did, even though Jacob did it deceitfully. He had to pay for every bit of it. But Esau's love was not toward the Lord God like Jacob's was. Such a technique accomplished several important things simultaneously. First of all, it served to emphasize the people's obstinance 
or ignorant. In other words, they did not realize that they were sitting in God's house with no enthusiasm about God. When God, through the prophet, laid out the evidence to support his initial claim, the people's question was made to look completely foolish. It was not sacrilegious. In the open oracle, the very fact that the people of God dwelt once again in their homeland, that should have been a blessing within itself. That should have been given the people enthusiasm and made them happy in their heart. There should have been excitement in the air to even go into God's house when they were taken out of God's house for so many years and in captivity with a heathen God and a heathen people. While the nation of Edom had been expunged from world history was proof enough that God truly did love them and had kept his word to them. And even though he was not happy with the way they were and punished them for what they did, he still brought them back because he loved them. And there was a love that he had that he could not get rid of. There was a love and a promise that he made that he couldn't go against. Hallelujah. The oracle served to bring Israel and God back into conversation. As was mentioned above, the issue in Malachi's day was not so much the people rebelling against God as it was a kind of passive, aggressive ignoring of God. So they were almost pretending they were saying one thing but doing another, yet in the house of God. By structuring the prophetic words as imaginative dialogues between the people and God, Malachi was helping to reconnect the estranged parties. And that's what he did in his own way. The way that God gave him, that's what brought the people back together. It says, Malachi did not attempt to encourage the people by focusing on a handful of things that, were, that they were doing right or by trying to justify their motives. Sometimes that can be a problem when somebody is doing something that's wrong, but they're doing certain things that are right. We compliment the things that they're doing right, but we don't address the things that they're doing wrong. And we don't justify their motives. He blatantly and fully exposed their unrighteousness in Malachi 3 and 8. He asked the question, will a man rob God? Now, to rob God is almost an unbelievable statement. No one would, uh, would admit to it because it's something that you wouldn't do. But when he asked the question, he began to answer his own question. Yet ye have robbed me. But he said, wherein have we robbed thee? In tithes and offerings. Ye are cursed with a curse. For ye have robbed me even this whole nation. Though he was certainly sensitive to the people's fragile emotional state, he did not allow his concern for their feelings to override his prophetic task to rebuke unrighteousness and call for renewed covenant faithfulness. That's what we have to do in this day and time. You can't override the task the prophetic task that you have that God has given you. And sometimes you have to rebuke unrighteousness and call for renewed covenant faithfulness. And that's what he had to do. They didn't realize, they didn't recognize that their tithes and the monies that they had, they weren't using it to build up the house of God. God's house has to be taken care of. How else will it be taken care of if the people of God don't take care of it. However, God's word for the people did not stop with the pronouncement of a curse of their robbery. Malachi continued, bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there might be meat in my house, and prove me now herewith, with, saith the Lord of hosts, 
If I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that shall that there shall not be room enough to receive it, and I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes, and he shall not destroy the fruit of your ground. Neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time in the field, saith the Lord of hosts. And all nations shall call you blessed, for ye shall be a delightsome land, saith the Lord of hosts. You see what he did? He told them what they were doing. Hallelujah. He allowed Malachi to get their attention. Because when he said they were robbing God, that got their attention. But God let them know to bring all the tithes into the storehouse. Sometimes that's a problem for us even today. Hallelujah. The more money we make, the more reluctant we are to give God what belongs to him in the, in the first place. Because God was the one that allowed us to have strength in our body to even work the work and the job that we have. Hallelujah. When he tells us to bring the tithes into the storehouse, he doesn't tell us to give us what we think we should give them. I've heard different people say, well, I do different things. I help people. I feed people. I do this and I do that. But that's not what God was talking about. Bringing the tithes into the storehouse is your first fruits that you get, that you receive on your check. When you get it, it is your first duty to take the gross, not the net, off of the top and give it back to God so that it can be given and made use of in his house. He said, because I want you to do that so that there will be meat in my house. In other words, the lights will be turned on. If it needs to be cleaned the way it should be cleaned, we can pay somebody to clean the house of God. We can do the things that we have to do in the house of God if everybody did their share and brought the tithes and offerings into the storehouse. And then what he said, which I really appreciate about the Lord, you see, when he gives you something to do, he can back it up with his word. He said in his word, when you do this, prove me. Don't go and beg somebody else. Prove me. If I told you to pay your tithes, don't go ask someone else for a loan. Ask me. Say, Lord, I paid my tithes like you told me to do. Now I need money to pay my bills. He said, prove me. And when you prove me, he said, now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts. He said, if I will not open up you the windows. In other words, if you prove me, watch what I do to you if you trust me with the little bit of money that you're going to give me. See what I'll do back to you if you follow my, uh, my um, the things that I told you to do. I ask you to do it, and if you do it, prove me and see what I'll do back to you. He said, I will pour you out a blessing. And I'm not going to just pour you out a mediocre blessing, but I'm going to pour you out a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive it. In other words, you will have to give it away. You'll have to give it to somebody that you see that's in need because you've got enough. He will overflow you with his blessings if you prove him with your tithes and your offerings. Stop making excuses. Do what the word of the Lord told you to do. He said, and I will also rebuke the devourer for your sakes. In other words, when they try to come and do things to you to take what I blessed you with, I will rebuke them for your sakes. And they shall not destroy anything that you have planted, not the fruit of your ground or nothing around it. Neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time in the field, saith the Lord of hosts. Now because the Lord of hosts is speaking and he is faithful always, this is what you have to believe. And this is the time that you have to say, you know, I'm going to do better. I'm going to give my tithes and my offerings to the house of the Lord. Because this is what I should do, that there may be meat 
in God's house. And not only that, he said in all nations, I want you to hear this, people will look at you and know that God has blessed you yes. and none other. People will look at you and know that you are a part of the heritage of God. He said all nations shall call you blessed, for you shall be a delightsome land, saith the Lord of hosts. Now if the Lord says it, that settles it. And that's what we need to look at today because we know that God is always faithful. Faithful to those that trust him. Faithful to those that believe in him. Faithful to those that love him and keep his commandments. Faithful to those that are obedient to his word. Faithful to those that love, hallelujah, beyond, continue to love, hallelujah. Hallelujah. We call him a faithful God. We do serve a faithful God. I want to encourage you about that today. Even when you feel like things are a little low and you don't want to do certain things because you're saving it for a rainy day. If it belongs to God, give it to God. Hallelujah. And when the rains come, you won't even have to worry about the rains coming because you gave to God first what he required of thee. Malachi's disputational method accomplished one further objective. By laying side by side the questions of the people and the claims of Jehovah. Malachi used the Jews' unfaithfulness to God to highlight God's faithfulness to them. In other words, he was letting them know why would you give God something that you won't even give to a human? You would not give a human something that's blemished, something that's lame, something that's sickly. You would not do that. You would give them something better than that. So why are you giving God less than you would even give to humans? Malachi 3, for example, opened up with the predication of coming of the coming of my messenger who will prepare the way of the Lord. A passage familiar to us because the New Testament saw in it a prediction of the ministry of John the Baptist. You see, everything that we've done, everything that we're even going through now has already been pre-recorded by the Lord and the messengers and the prophets of God have already prophesied of what was to happen. However, we forget that Malachi foresaw the coming of the messenger as a harbinger of judgment. Hallelujah. But who may abide the day of his coming? And who shall stand when he appeareth? For he is like a refiner's fire and like fuller's soap. And I will come near to you to judgment. And I will be swift, a swift witness against the sorcerers and against the adulterers and against false swearers and against those that oppress the hireling of his wages, the widow and the fatherless, and that turned aside the stranger, the stranger from his right, and fear not me, saith the Lord of hosts. In other words, I'm giving you a chance to think about what you've done and know that the things that I said, I'm faithful in doing them. I'm the Lord and I change it not. These are the things that he's letting you know in the time that you're having to think about what is going on in your lives even today. Hallelujah. What lessons were the Jews to draw from the fearsome picture Malachi painted? He let them know that they were cursed with a curse. Now that's something that we take lightly. We don't feel that it's important to pay our tithes but maybe we haven't read the completing of the scripture. The completion of the scripture says that you are cursed with a curse. That's a double curse on your life. 
If you are not paying your tithes, even on today, this is a time that you must reevaluate and begin to pay your tithes to the household of God, where you attend your church. Hallelujah. What was a logical conclusion to these images of swift and final judgment? For I am the Lord. I change not. In other words, I'm today, I'm yesterday, and I'm forevermore. What I say is a amen. When I say something, I don't have to take it back because I am the Lord and I change not. Therefore, ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. You could have been consumed because I could have done it back in the day when you uh, chose not to be obedient to me, but I'm the Lord that changeth not. I promised something to Abraham, and I have to keep that promise. That's why you're not consumed. The lesson here, then, was not that God was angry or vengeful, or even that he was mighty above all. Malachi wanted to remind the people that God was faithful. If he said he's going to do something, he will do it. But he has to do it, hallelujah, in righteousness. He has to do it when he corrects his people when they're not doing right. That's when he turns around and does it again after they have been corrected and have turned from their wicked ways back to him and have repented. Hallelujah. A closing reminder. It is by no means coincidental that the book of Malachi serves as a conclusion of the prophetic corpus and to the entire Old Testament. If you notice, Malachi is at the very end of the Old Testament. Malachi brings together discussions of the 70 of the upcoming judge of the coming judgment, the seriousness of sinful disobedience, the breathtaking power of the divine promises under the rubric of divine faithfulness. That faithfulness guarantees both punishment for the wicked and salvation for those who repent of their wickedness. That's a very um, important sentence. I'm going to read it again to all of those that are listening to my voice. That faithfulness guarantees both punishment for the wicked and salvation or deliverance for those who repent of their wickedness. In other words, God will not hold you to your wickedness if you repent. Hallelujah. Centuries before the prophet Malachi lived, Israel, proto-prophet, who authored the beginning books of the Old Testament, stood before the people of Israel with the same message. So Malachi ended it in the Old Testament, but had already gone forth sometime back before Malachi appeared. And this is what it said. I call heaven and earth to record this day against you that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that both thou and thy seed may live, that thou mayest love the Lord thy God and that thou mayest obey his voice and that thou mayest cleave unto him, for he is thy life and the length of thy days, that thou mayest dwell in the land which the Lord swear unto thy fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give to them. So God was letting them know, I'm going to speak to you on today, letting you know that I'm placing life and death before you blessings and cursings. It's up to you to choose either one, but I suggest that you choose life, that you and your seed may live, and that thou mayest love the Lord thy God, and that thou mayest obey his voice, and that thou mayest cleave unto him. Those were the words of the prophet, hallelujah, back in the Old Testament of Deuteronomy. 
as in the days of Moses and Malachi. These two same options stand before us today. God's righteous purpose will accomplish in this world. Will we serve him or choose to serve ourselves? When we think about that, we look at the day and time that we live in and we have to recognize something. No matter what we're doing, no matter what we see that's going on, we don't have to worry because we serve a God that is always faithful. Hallelujah. I'm going to read the scriptures to you and then we'll have someone come to internalize the message on today. Are you going to? Okay. I'll internalize the message on today. It says, And a son honoreth his father, and a servant his master. If then I be a father, where is my honor? And if I be a master, where is my fear? Saith the Lord of hosts unto you, O priest that despise my name. And ye say, Wherein have we despised thy name? Ye offer polluted bread upon my altar. And ye say, Wherein have we polluted thee? In that ye say, The table of the Lord is contemptible. And if ye offer the blind for sacrifice, it is not evil. And if ye offer the lame and sick, is it not evil? Offer it now unto the governor. Will he be pleased with it or accept thy person, saith the Lord of hosts. And now I pray you, beseech God that he will be gracious, that he will be gracious unto you. This had been by your means, and he will regard your persons, saith the Lord of hosts. Who is there even among you that would shut the doors for naught? Neither do ye kindle fire on my altar for naught. I have no pleasure in you, saith the Lord of hosts. Neither will I accept an offering at your hand. For from the rising of the sun, even unto the going down of the same, my name shall be great among the Gentiles. And in every place incense shall be offered unto my name, and a pure offering. For my name shall be great among the heathen, saith the Lord of hosts. But ye have profaned it. In that ye say, the table of the Lord is polluted, and the fruit thereof, even his meat, is contemptible. Ye say also, behold, what a weariness it is. And ye have snuffed at it, saith the Lord of hosts. And ye brought that which was torn unto me, and the lame, and the sick. Thus ye brought an offering. Should I accept this of your hand, saith the Lord? But cursed be the deceiver, which hath in his flock a male, and boweth, and sacrifice unto the Lord a corrupt thing. For I am a great king saith the Lord of hosts, and my name is dreadful among the heathen. In other words, I am too great for you to give me anything other than what I require. I'm a great God. I'm a great king. I'm not going to accept everything that you give me unless it is acceptable by me and validated by me. Hallelujah. As we internalize the message on today, we look at our world who mistakenly believes the way to overcome negative feelings of discouragement is to either ignore them completely, pretending they are not real, or overwhelm them with positive thoughts of success and well-being. Hallelujah. Malachi, however, shows us something different. He confronts our discouragement by getting to the root of the problem. And that's what we all need. We need to get 
to the root of the problem. If you are a dentist and you have a problem with your teeth, they do a root canal that get to the problem and they take out anything that should not be there. And this goes the same with a person in their spirit. If they have discouragement and things are going on, someone needs to address it, that they might get to the root of the problem and that person be free from their discouragement. We must acknowledge and confront our own shortcomings and backslidings. If we have shortcomings and backslidings, we have to stand up and admit that we have shortcomings and backslidings. And then we need to go back to the Lord, turn toward him and repent. Those areas where we have lost our focus and our passion for what we know is right to do. We can do so. Though with honesty, when you are honest with yourself, that pleases the Lord. That's the first step of your healing. Because we are undergirded by the unshaken faithfulness of God and his promises to protect and provide for us, through repentance, we can find renewed strength. We can find renewed vision. We can find renewed focus. Just the encouragement we need to live an overcoming life of victory. Hallelujah. We need to know that God is faithful. We need to know that God is the one that will cover us if we are faithful unto him as well. He will protect us and provide unto us. Hallelujah. I hope something was said on today that would help you to know that God is faithful and also help you to know what you can do to cause God to be faithful unto you and your situation by paying your tithes and offerings into the house of God. At this time, we would like to extend an invitation of covenant fellowship to you to become a part of our growing ministry. Please complete this form on our website at www.gwanlc.org. Look under Contact Us. Someone will respond to your request. Remember, you cannot join this ministry without being born again of the water and spirit. According to St. John 3, 1 through 7, and Acts 2, 38, you must be born again. Have you subscribed to our YouTube channel? New videos are posted for those who have not seen our live posts. You can watch the services in its entirety. Our channel is under Greater Works, Apostolic, New Life Center, Inglewood. Click on the subscribe button. Thank you for supporting this ministry by sowing seeds into the kingdom. God bless you. We have methods electronically such as Givelify, Cash App, and PayPal on our website. Again, www.gwanlc.org. If you are not able to give electronically, you may send a check or money order to Greater Works Apostolic New Life Center, P.O. Box 1066, Inglewood, California, 90301. Again, we say thank you and God bless you in Jesus' name.